Every January here at Mile High Church, we go uh, back to basics. So we have a five-week series Michelle and I are sharing with you. Spiritual practices for healing, thriving, and peace of mind. Sound good? And in these series, we want to give you the opportunity to go a little bit deeper. And so on our watch page, uh, you'll find that there's some curriculum. You can do it on your own. Uh, We have small groups that gather. You can do it within your family. If you're interested in these small groups, um, email smallgroups at milehighchurch.org, and I'll get you some more info. And I also encourage you to sign up on our website for something called our Daily Pearl. Uh, It's just a little quote of inspiration for your day. Great spiritual practice, and this month will go along with our series. There's an old joke about a man who goes to see his psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist says, uh, what's what's going on today? And he says, well, my my problem is, is that my brother thinks he's a chicken. Well, the psychiatrist says, have you thought of turning him in? And the man says, yes, but there's just one problem. What is that, the doctor said. And the man says, I need the eggs. (laughs) And I often think of that joke when I see the pessimist trying to knock down the optimist, when I see the realist trying to criticize the idealist, when I see the atheist trying to knock down the religionist. There's nothing wrong with being those things, but the truth is we all need the aches. There's this nature in our human psyche to seek out the truth, even in the midst of the most challenging to understand mystery. There's a very part of our human nature that seeks myth, story, that wants to understand. And what that requires, I think, in a mature culture is a willingness to be open at the top, to be willing to study life and to be willing to change our mind, evolve, and to grow. What this calls for is an ethical spirituality that reflects our values, freedom, inclusivity, equality, and a spirituality that um, is willing to embrace wisdom from all different areas. And I believe that the science of mind and spirit represents this teaching. That's why I'm a part of it. That's why I'm a minister in it. That's why I'm so joyful to get to share about it today. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, says of it, let us then approach the science of mind the science of spiritual psychology, with awe, but not with fear, with truly a humble thought, but not with a sense that we are unworthy. Let us approach it normally, happily, willing to accept, glad to experiment, hoping and believing that as the result of our efforts, we shall each derive a great good, a sound understanding of the natural laws of life as they apply to the individual and his relationship to the whole universal scheme of things. Spiritual psychology. Isn't that a good term for what we teach? That we're a spiritual psychology. Because we're so built around this thing called mind or consciousness. And psychology without spirituality has a tendency to reduce mind, consciousness, thought to biology. To what happened to you in your past, to what concerns you about your future. But when we add spiritual to it, we also see that our mind, our consciousness, is connected to the possible. That our minds aren't just machines processing, but they're creative. It's in the creativity of our mind that we also, in our teaching, believe that our minds are also related to the infinite. That through our consciousness, through our soul, we touch the divine spirit, and it moves through us. And we have a little name for this practice. Change your thinking, change your life. If you can change your thinking about something, you can change your life. Gosh, if I change my perspective about my job, I might just enjoy it more. If I change my story about my partner or my spouse, I might just heal my relationship. 
if I can do a little work each day to improve my self-image, I might be healthier and happier and more fulfilled. I invite you this morning, first day of 2023, to become aware of that part of your life that could use some changing, that can use some transformation. Can you think about what it is? I'll wait. (laughs) Have you got it? Linda, have you got it? Randy, you got it? Steve, you got it? Okay. And I also invite you to ask yourself if there's an area of your life where you're leaving God out. Is it time to allow a greater spiritual possibility into this area of your life? To stop behaving like a demurge that thinks that you have control and so understand this area and its negativity and how it's bothering you that nothing could be changed or transformed? Are you willing to let a greater spirit reveal itself in this situation? I want to pause here and take a tangent. It's our Back to Basics series, and so I'd like to share a little history about how this teaching got to be the way that it is today. Our founder is named Ernest Holmes. He founded the Institute of Religious Science in 1927. He passed away in 1960. We don't see him as a messianic figure here, but just a really spiritually dialed-in guy who was a great synthesizer of all sorts of information, a wonderful mystic. Now, one thing to understand about our teaching is that at its very heart, it is inspired and informed by the teachings of Jesus. We are not a traditional form of Christianity, and I'll explain why in a moment, but everything that we do is centered on the incredible teachings of Jesus. One way I like to explain our teaching to people sometimes is to say that we're Christianity without the hell. We're Christianity without the hell. We don't practice the belief in hell. It's perfectly fine if if anyone does. But what that means to us is, first and foremost, we don't believe God has an opposite. We believe that the the love of God, the grace of God... The creativity of God cannot be opposed. It stands alone, and therefore we are all one. We are all united in spirit. It also means, although we see the incredible transformation that can take place when one takes the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of Christ in their hearts, we don't require salvation because we don't see anything to be saved from other than our own limited thinking. And lastly, that means that we don't require anyone to be exclusively a member of a single faith so that it opens us up to see that there is wisdom in all faiths and we can encourage people to follow their spiritual path, whatever it is. It reminds me of Martin Luther King Jr. who said of Gandhi, a Hindu, that he was the greatest practicing Christian that ever lived. (laughs) Now, next to the teachings of Jesus, the most influential thinker on our philosophy and on Ernest Holmes was Ralph Waldo Emerson, the great 19th century writer and lecturer, really brought forth the inventiveness, the creativity of the American mind, and his fountains move into poetry and art and film. Such an important figure, not just in America, but to spiritual philosophy. And everything that you hear in our teaching can be traced back to Emerson. Here's some things that he said. Life is a train of moods like a string of beads, and as we pass through them, they prove to be many colored lenses, which paint the world their own hue, and each shows only what lies in its focus. He also said, is not prayer also a study of truth, a sally of the soul into the unfound infinite? Within man is the soul of the whole, the wise silence, the universal beauty to which every particle is equally related, the eternal one. If you believe in fate to your harm, believe it at least for your good. Have you, have you heard of pronoia? Do you know what pronoia is? Paranoia being that practice of fearing that everyone and everything is against you. Pronoia being the practice of believing that everyone and everything is for you and working towards your good. 
a contemporary of Emerson's was a guy named Phineas Quimby. And Phineas Quimby was a clockmaker, and he was a mesmerist, which was like an early form of hypnotism. We were just learning and beginning to theorize about this thing called the subconscious or the unconscious mind. And Quimby developed a theory, he was a religious man as well, that by knowing the spiritual truth, aligning your consciousness with the spiritual truth, you could experience physical as well as psychological healing. Powerful theory. And when he died, it kind of created two branches. One of his students was Mary Baker Eddy, who founded the religion of Christian science, one of the great religions founded in America, first founded by a woman, very revolutionary, and you know, to be frank too, kind of rigid, a very rigid form of Quimby's theory. The other thread was kind of all over the place, but what it did is it took Quimby's theory of spiritual healing and combined it with the philosophy of Emerson. And so grew about many different faiths, including divine science, Unity School of Christianity, and our faith, religious science. Something that's unique about religious science is its commitment to what we might call the golden thread, the wisdom that we can find in all faiths that is common and we can integrate into our lives. So what is our teaching? It is centered in the heart of the teachings of Jesus, inspired by the philosophy of Emerson and the emerging values of America, focused on prayer and pragmatism, seeking the wisdom of all the great religious traditions so that we can live a great life and help improve the life of others. Sound good? Yeah. So let's get back to the, the pragmatic part, this changing our lives part. Uh, I'll be talking about this in the intention workshop today after service, but I invite you to ask yourself right now, are you open to 2023 being the best year of your life? <laughs> Easy for some of us with the challenges of the last few years. So that, that's good. Now I'm not saying it's going to be the best year of your life. What I'm asking you is, are you open to it? And check to see if there's some part of you that says, no way. This past year was so much better. I'm faced with so many struggles right now. There's no way this can be the best year. And all I'm asking you is to be open. Be open to 2023 being the best year of your life. And I have the practice for you to do it. It's called change your thinking, change your life. Change your thinking, change your life. Now, for some of us, that sounds pretty broad because it is broad. So I want to give a few specific ways of practicing it today and to give and offer some habits that we can practice throughout this whole year that will uplift and transform our lives. The first is change your habit, change your experience. That's part of what change your thinking, change your life means. Change your habit, change your experience. And any good behaviorist will tell us that if you want to change something, it's not just about getting rid of the bad habit. It's about replacing it and filling in good habits in your life. There's a wonderful, wonderful book called Tiny Habits uh, by B.J. Fogg. Um, we already sold out in our bookstore, so I must have been effective in the first service, uh, but they'll have it next week. You can go to Amazon, learn how to do Amazon Smile and give to Mile High Church through our give page, uh, but you can get the book there. And it's a, it's a powerful book and an initial habit that he invites all of us to practice. He calls the Maui habit. He developed it in Maui. It's very simple. It goes like this. When you wake up in the morning and put your feet on the ground, Declare, today is going to be a great day. When you get up in the morning and put your feet on the floor, say, today is going to be a great day. That's it. That's the habit. And one of the things that's brilliant about Fogg's work is he recognizes what he calls anchors. These things that we do in our everyday life, no matter what. Get out of bed. Brush our teeth, I hope. 
eat meals, drop the kids off at school, put the kids into bed, uh, lay our head on the pillow. And this is the perfect space, he says, to build these tiny habits that can create healing and well-being in your life. And you can take that phrase, it's going to be a great day, and make it however affirmative you want to make it. Uh, But I've been practicing it for a few months, and, and here's what I've noticed. The first is it's so great to begin my day with an affirmation. Now, I can't say that I wake up with with negative thoughts, but there are certainly days where I'm not thinking as positively as today is going to be a great day. So it's great to start off on a good fit. The other thing is it's like a little win. It's a little victory. I did my tiny habit. First thing when I woke up in the morning, and Fogg talks about this as well, it creates a momentum that helps you make even healthier choices and take bigger strides throughout your day to improve your life. That's the tiny habit. Third is when I'm practicing these tiny habits, this affirmation, I can catch myself in the day. Is every day a great day? Maybe not, but when I'm grumpy or in a place of blame or victimhood, I get to remind myself what I told myself in the morning, that I'm choosing to have a great day. And making that choice makes all the difference. Change your habit, change your experience. Another way to say change your thinking, change your life, is change your story, change your conclusion. Change your story, change your conclusion. I think it's also the nature of our psyche as well to create story because we want to connect and find the truth, fictional or non-fictional. We just want to get to the truth. And yet the unfortunate truth is, is too many of us have limited our lives because of the stories we tell ourselves. Many of us see ourselves at the end of the story of our lives because of a negative story, when the truth is we are simply stuck on the page at the end of a chapter that we don't yet know how to move on from. And if we could just stop and pause and ask ourselves, is this a true story? This story about blame about so-and-so, about how I can't get past my struggles, about how the world or the country is this way or that way. If I could just open up to a different story being possible, I might just change the page and move forward in my life and live in a new and profound way. And so a little practice. The next time you catch yourself telling yourself a story that gives you negative vibes, that doesn't make you feel good, simply ask yourself, is this a true story? Is this story different from someone else's perspective? If I looked at this like a journalist or a detective, just the facts, ma'am, would the story be different? is perhaps God telling a different story here that I've yet to hear or become open to. How can we open ourselves up to that greater story taking place in our lives? To ask ourselves, is this story bringing me closer to what the real truth is or taking me away from what the truth can be? The great Martin Fisher once said, what is a conclusion? It's that place where you got tired of thinking. Let's open up, expand, and see what's new that can emerge. If uh, you were confused or didn't like my whole Emerson, Phineas uh, explanation of our teaching, um, here's another simple way to say what our teaching is. I'll put it in one word, Oprah. (laughs) We're kind of the church of Oprah, right? (laughs) And at Mile High Church and in our teaching, we love Oprah. If we found out Oprah was coming to Mile High Church, it would be like the Pope was visiting. We would put out red carpets. There would be delegations. We would have pictures of Oprah everywhere because we love Oprah. And she's probably more responsible than any individual out there of bringing aspects of our teaching out into the world. And that's one reason why we love her. The other is she's a perfect example of what it means to change your thinking and change your life. Here's a young woman that grew up in a boarding home. She was abused physically, mentally, sexually, traumatized. 
She was growing up a young black woman in a culture that told her she could only accomplish so much because of those two facts. And eventually she got to live with her, her father, Vern, who actually passed away this past summer. She shared that her father was uh, her bridge over troubled water in her life. And she said that her father taught her a work ethic, values, how, how to focus and commit yourself to your goals. Uh, and that, that's just what Oprah did. She developed an interest in, in media and, and focused on that and got on the news. And before she knew it, she was hosting a, a show in Illinois called AM Chicago, the lowest rated show, uh, morning show. Uh, and then uh, eventually they would, they would change the name of it to the Oprah Winfrey Show. And the, and the rest is history. But not only did she get to learn and was so blessed to have her father, but she, she was able to open up to a new story in her life. She would share, you don't become what you want you become what you believe. How powerful of her to overcome the stories that were issued to her by the people that abused her, by the limits in the society that she may have seen around her, by so much negative self-image that came through what she experienced to open up to what could God's story in my life be? What is spirit's story for my life? And I ask you, what is God's story for your life? What is Spirit's story for your life? Or at the least, just be open to a new story emerging that just possibly, and this is my greatest sin, I may not always be right. Change your story, change your conclusion. And lastly today, change your worldview change your world. Change your worldview, change your world. Now, one aspect for many people who practice our faith is this idea to see reality as you would like it to be and to see if reality conforms to that. You know, law of attraction, law of circulation, and this is all very well and good, but there's another layer to it which is learning and dedicating ourselves to seeing reality, not as we want it to be, but as it is. And to find such glory in the experience of seeing the world as it is, life as it really could be, that all of the blessings we seek become a natural byproduct of seeing the world as it is, in its beauty, Yes, even in its flaws, but in its magnificence. To stop right here and right now and take a deep breath. <sighs> Damn, I'm alive. <laughs> it's a miracle, folks, to be alive, to be here, to be present. Give yourself the miracle of opening up to the possibilities that that means to live a thriving life, to be committed to what you value, to live profoundly, to have the courage to be who you really are. Holmes tells us, our thinking doesn't change reality at all. Some people think it does, but it never flattened the world when they thought it was flat. It only flattened their experience on a round one. You take that, flat earthers. <laughs> when someone knew it was round, they could navigate it. That's part of our charge in our spiritual practice to unflatten our consciousness and to learn to navigate on this round world. To not just limit ourselves to the fact that we are on this hurling gas ball flying through space seemingly with no destination in mind, but to open up that this world of ours is so precious and is also held by grace and that you are a production of what it is and has something that it needs, that spirit needs to bring forth the blessings of who you are. And again, we receive all the blessings and the byproduct of that is it blesses everyone around us as well. So that when we put our head on the pillow at the end of each night, we can say, thank you, life. Thank you, life. 
Change your thinking, change your life means change your worldview and change your world. I've touched upon three habits in my talk today that I want to reiterate in closing. Sorry. The first habit, B.J. Fogg's Maui habit. When you wake up and put your feet on the ground, say, today is going to be a great day. Second habit, throughout the week or the day, and you'll be amazed at how many stories you tell yourself, by the way, when you're paying attention to this. When you tell yourself a story that makes you not feel good, stop, ask yourself, is this a true story? Be honest with yourself. Is this a true story or is there more to the story that could be told if I let go of this final conclusion? Is this a true story? And lastly, when you put your head on your pillow at night, say, thank you, life. Thank you, life. Think about the things that you're grateful about that happened during the day. Think about the things that you want to be grateful for tomorrow. But end the day in that gratitude, which for me is the only true lens in which to view this incredible thing called life, this precious gift we've all been given. Let us appreciate it and utilize it fully. So moving into prayer today, I invite any of our practitioner prayer partners who'd like to stand and join me. So knowing that this practice of prayer, which I also invite each of us into a daily practice of, is simply a recognition of the current state of our relationship with God, with spirit, with the divine. It is in prayer that we not only communicate with, but allow the divine to communicate with us. It is here, as Emerson said, that we study the truth that we see things from a whole point of view and we can anchor ourselves in this spirit as we go about our day-to-day lives. And this spirit, this prayer that each of us has the ability and the gift of, it creates a sanctuary, a sanctuary where we can place ourselves, our best intentions, where we can place people that we love, this world that we live in, the greatest challenges and the most wonderful celebrations. We hold it in this sanctuary of prayerfulness and allow it to receive the light of the divine through our consciousness and transformation occurs. We hold whatever we choose in this space for healing, for peace and for harmony, for prosperity and an abundance of friendship and good relations, for the well-being of our families, our communities, our country, and our world. We hold everything within this sanctuary, letting nothing in that is unsafe. And in this, we know and reveal that greater story that the divine is telling. And as we listen to it, it writes itself in our hearts, and we are able to live more profoundly, more clearly, and with more and more joy. We let this be in gratitude, and so it is.